Funding for Nova Science Now is provided by To find that robot, the show where our electronic bachelorette tries to guess which of our three mystery contestants is not human. Because sometimes, like on the internet, the difference is not obvious. Bachelor number one, what is your idea of the perfect date? I'd take you to the finest restaurant, and I'd recite love poems to you while we sip expensive champagne. Mom, I don't drink. <laughs> Bachelor number two. We would take a long walk on the beach, watch a beautiful sunset, and I'd learn all about you by moonlight. Great. <laughs> Bachelor number three. What is your idea of the perfect date? The perfect date is June 23rd, 1912. He's the one. Aw, oh, what a lovely couple. In this episode's profile, we'll meet a guy who not only invented a way for one computer to spot another computer, but a way to do it that will actually help mankind. <laughs> Luis Van Ahn may seem like a slacker. He loves watching television. I watch a lot of TV. That's how I spend most of my time outside of work. If I had more time, I would fill it 100% with watching TV. Right now, I'm watching Heroes, Dexter, Fringe, Weeds. I've been watching Weeds as well. When he's not watching TV, Luis is playing games. I definitely play some games like Nintendo DS or the Wii and some computer games. Luis is the kind of person who gets a game and he wants to beat the game. You know, play it nonstop until he beats it. Luis even calls everybody dude. Uh, that's a really good trick if you don't know their name. Just like, dude. <laughs> and they're like, dude. But Luis is no slacker. He's a hotshot Carnegie Mellon computer science professor. He drives a Porsche. And at age 30, he's quickly raced to the top of his field. You may have read about him and you've almost certainly used his cutting-edge computer programs. So when Luis watches TV and plays games, he's actually doing serious research. I don't think it's relaxation for him. In fact, I've never known him to relax. He is a sponge just trying to understand what motivates this social animal, which is the masses. And unbeknownst to you, you're probably already working for Luis fighting spam, digitizing books, and labeling images on the web. You're part of Luis's master plan to mobilize the largest workforce in the history of mankind, the hundreds of millions of people who use the internet. One of the things that I'm trying to figure out is what can we do with this many people? What can you do when you can get 100 million people working on the same thing? Uh, and I think we could do amazing things. As for the source of his ideas, Luis is a human think tank. I guess I'm a big pacer. I, I pace when I do most things. So yeah, when I'm trying to think or solve a problem, I pace around. Anytime he has a problem and he's sort of ruminating over the problem, that's what he does. You would see him walk up and down that hallway 20 times a day. He can take a, a, a problem that seems impossible and just sort of see the solution, see through it. I have multiple ideas per day, all the time. The vast majority of these are completely idiotic. Usually I just sit on the idea for several months, and if I have not decided that it's idiotic, uh, then it might be a good idea. Luis's first big idea came when he and his advisor, Manuel Bloom, were approached by Yahoo. The chief scientist at Yahoo told us he had a problem. The problem was spam and it was clogging up Yahoo. Spammers needed a vast number of email accounts to send their spam, and they were using automated computer programs to sign up for them. Spammers were writing programs to obtain millions of Yahoo email accounts every day because they wanted to send spam. Luis and Manuel needed a way to tell the difference between a well-meaning Yahoo subscriber 
and a malicious spam computer program. We came up with this idea of trying to give a test to figure out whether it's a human or not. There's got to be a computerized test given to humans and computers, so the computer must be able to grade a test that it cannot pass. You know, it looks paradoxical. What Luis and Manuel developed was CAPTCHA, a secret password that people can read, but computers can't. The computer can take some characters, and it can put them on a rubber sheet, and it can then stretch this sheet and pour paint on it and change the looks of these characters to the point where it can no longer see the original characters and then can put it out there knowing that humans are still very good at being able to recognize this. So using CAPTCHA, people could sign up for Yahoo accounts, but automated spam programs could not. CAPTCHA has spread across the web and is now used by most major websites. CAPTCHA's had this amazing impact. There are fairly good estimates that uh, more than 750 million different people in the world have solved at least one CAPTCHA. Luis's resourcefulness and his quest for efficiency go back as far as he can remember. As a boy growing up in Guatemala, where his family owned a candy factory. I think growing up in a candy factory has influenced me. It's quite a complex process, the machines of making the candy and wrapping it and everything. I always wondered how all those machines worked. At the age of seven, Luis even built his own machine to do his homework faster. I was taking a penmanship class. The assignments were to draw a lot of ovals, like a gazillion ovals, and that was really boring. So what I did is I put like five pens together. I was just using that one thing with the five pens and it was going five times faster. Uh, of course I got caught. Uh, but I, I, it was great while it lasted. Doing my homework in you know, 20 minutes as opposed to uh, an hour and a half. 20 years later, Luis applied the same kind of efficiency to the time wasted typing in captions. I started feeling bad because each time you type a captcha, you know, those squiggly characters, essentially you waste 10 seconds of your time. And if you multiply that by 200 million, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting like 500,000 hours every day typing these annoying CAPTCHAs. I started thinking, is there a way in which we can use this human effort for something that's good for humanity? Can we make good use of those 10 seconds of your time? Luis struggled with this question. And then he got involved with an even bigger project, putting all the old books in the world onto the internet. There's a lot of projects out there trying to digitize books. So Google has one, the Internet Archive has another one. But there's a problem. Many of the books are old and faded. So when computers scan them, they don't recognize many of the words. For things that were in before 1900, between 30 and 40% of the words, the computer's gonna decipher wrong. They were written at a time when the type didn't line up always nicely and what remnants we have of it are smudged. Luis's solution was to take those hard-to-read words from old books and use them as CAPTCHAs. But this raised a new problem. The computer would now present a word that it could not read in the first place. The computer didn't know what the answer was. How is it to be able to tell what the right answer is? Luis found a solution to combine the word from an old book with a traditional CAPTCHA generated by the computer. We'll give two tests, one that we know the answer to, one that we don't. And if the person can solve the one that we know the answer to, then we'll assume they can solve the one that we don't. They called it reCAPTCHA. Now, every time you type a CAPTCHA, you may very well be working for Luis, transcribing an old book. Today, on the order of 125 to 150 books per day are being digitized because of reCAPTCHA. It's an amazing thing. And it's not just books. reCAPTCHA is also transcribing the entire back archive of the New York Times. The New York Times has this huge archive of 130 years of newspaper archive there, and we've done maybe about 20 years so far of the New York Times in the last few months, and I believe we're gonna be done next year by just having people do a word at a time. With CAPTCHA and reCAPTCHA under his belt, Luis was a hot commodity when he graduated with his PhD from Carnegie Mellon. He became this kind of sensation. People immediately understood that there was something very new here. I had offers from Microsoft and Yahoo and all kinds of companies. For the Microsoft offer, they even had Bill Gates call me. But Luis wanted to become a professor. I did turn my back on a lot of money, but in the end I decided that uh, I liked the academic job better. Just days after taking a teaching job at Carnegie Mellon, 
Luis won the half million dollar MacArthur Fellowship. When I found out that I had won the MacArthur Fellowship, I had been a professor at Carnegie Mellon for a week. I probably shouldn't be saying this on TV, but I, I stopped worrying about tenure. Uh, <laughs> please give me tenure. <laughs> and it's not just the Genius Grant that may help Luis get tenure. Luis Vanan is one of our very best teachers. In fact, last year, he won one of the top awards for teaching here at Carnegie Mellon. So my philosophy for teaching is make it interesting or fun or just keep them engaged. That's the most important thing. Secondary to that is teaching them something. <laughs> The perfect date is June 23rd, 1912.